Thank you, Muriel. Appreciate you doing that for us today. Uh, if you have not met her, my wife Jane is sitting back here. I'm delighted to have her with me today uh, in support. Uh, there was a rich man who had a party at his house. And he invited all the eligible bachelors in the neighborhood to come to his party. He had a big pool in the backyard and he gathered all of these eligible bachelors around the pool. And in the pool, he had put alligators. And he said, if any one of you would dare to jump in the pool and swim to the other side, I'll give you one of two things. I'll give you a million dollars in cash or you can marry my beautiful daughter, either one. Who'll be first? They all looked at each other like, what in the world is going on here? And all of a sudden, one of them went into the water. And he was ducking and swimming and, and doing everything he could to, to avoid all the alligators. Somehow, miraculously, he made it out on the other side of the pool. He was bloody and bruised, but he was okay otherwise. And the man, rich man said, would you like a million dollars in cash? And the man said, no, I, I don't want a million dollars in cash. He said, well, then do you want to marry my beautiful daughter? And he said, no, I don't want to marry your beautiful daughter. He said, well, what do you want then? He said, I want about five minutes with a guy who shoved me into the swimming pool. <laughs> Well, some of you might rather go into a pool of alligators than to have a guest preacher come, but uh, you're stuck with me today, so there you are. Oh, I'm delighted to be here and to be a part of your worship this morning. Jesus has just fed a crowd of 5,000 people. One of the greatest miracles in the entire Bible, when he took five loaves of bread and two fish multiplied that many times over and fed the crowd. He went with his disciples down to the Lake of Galilee and he said, you fellows get in the boat and go to the other side of the lake and I'll catch up with you later. And then he went and dismissed the crowd. And when he dismissed the crowd, Jesus went into the hills by himself to pray. Every time I read about Jesus going off to pray by himself, I think if Jesus, the only perfect person the world has ever known, and the Son of God, if he needed to pray, if prayer was important to him, why is it not so important to us? We all need to spend a time in prayer, in time with prayer with, with God alone, wherever our altar is. Maybe it's outside, maybe it's inside the house, maybe it's in the church, wherever it is, we need to spend time with God in prayer. Jesus knew the importance of it, and we should as well. Well, while the disciples were out in the boat, and remember, several of them were fishermen, and they were used to being out in the boat and no doubt used to encountering storms on the boat. Well... There they were when the winds blew down and the waves began to lap over the side of the boat. And as you can imagine, they were afraid. Now Jesus could have stayed on the mountainside where it was quiet because the storm was no doubt just over the lake. He could have stayed there where it was quiet and peaceful, but that's not the Jesus we serve. He saw their dilemma and he made his way toward them. I had the privilege of going to Israel when I was in seminary back in the 1970s. I still remember it to this day. And one of the things we did was we took a boat across the Lake of Galilee. And while we were out there, our guide said, you know, it's very common for the winds to blow out of the mountains and cause a storm to come up over the lake very suddenly. And he said, you know, in the day of Jesus and his disciples, they had no weather forecast. They had no way of knowing that these storms were about to come up. 
And he said, that's likely what happened on that day. The storms came up suddenly, unexpectedly, and they were in trouble out in that lake. But Jesus began to walk across the water and make his way toward the disciples. Well, as if they were not afraid enough already, they look out and they see this figure walking across the top of the water. Now, my question to you this morning is, how many people have you ever seen walking on water? Not very many, I'm sure. If we had been in that boat, we would have had the same feeling. And they cried out to see who it was. And Jesus said, it's me, don't be afraid. And then Simon Peter said, if it is you, Jesus, let me come to you. Now you can say what you want to about Simon Peter. He was impulsive for sure, but he was also very dedicated to his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he was willing to take the risk to step out of that boat. Now I wonder if we had been in that boat that day, which of us would have stepped out of the boat. And I, in all likelihood, I would have said, Donnie, I tell you what, you step out first, and if everything works out okay, then I'll follow close behind. Or I would have put one leg over the side of the boat, tested the water with my leg, left the other, boat inside, um, other leg inside the boat just to be sure it was going to be safe. But Simon Peter didn't do that, did he? He stepped out of the boat. And sometimes we have to step out of the boat. We have to take risk to make our way to Jesus. It's not always easy. Jesus never promised us that being a Christian was going to be easy. He just promised us that it was going to be right. Well... Peter made his way toward Jesus. I heard a story years ago about a little boy named Timmy. Timmy was born with problems with his legs and he had to wear braces on his legs. But Timmy liked to do everything else all the other kids in the neighborhood did. For example, during the summertime, two or three afternoons a week, the other boys in the neighborhood would get together and play baseball. And so Timmy would go out there to join them for baseball. And you remember how they used to do that. They would choose up teams. They'd get two of them, and one would choose the members of his team, and the other would choose the member of his team. And they always chose the best players first. I know that for a fact. Because when I was a kid, and they were choosing up teams, they'd choose everybody before they got to me. And then one of them would say, you take Troy. No, 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 you take Troy. I know that feeling of being the last one picked. Well, Timmy was always picked last. And the reason he was picked last is because he was the worst player out there. So that particular day, sure enough, Timmy was picked last and they played the game. They got to the last inning of the game and the other team, the team that Timmy was not on, was ahead two to one. There were two outs, and guess who was coming up to bat? It was Timmy. He'd already been up to bat three times before and struck out every time. So the players on the other team thought, man, this is great. This couldn't have worked out any better for us. And the players on Timmy's team started packing up their gear, putting their gloves away, and getting on their bikes and getting ready to ride home because they knew the game was over. The pitcher threw the first ball. Timmy swung and missed it by a foot. The pitcher reared back through the second ball and once again, Timmy swung and missed it as he had every time in the game. The third time the pitcher threw the ball, miraculously, Timmy hit the ball right in the middle. They didn't have any fences, so the ball went over everybody's head and Timmy began to run as fast as he could, which was not very fast. His face was flushed, the veins in his neck were sticking out and he was trying so hard to score that tying run 
and made it to first base, and somehow another got the energy to make it to second base, and when he got to third base, he was straining for all he was worth. He got almost home, and he fell, and he began to crawl. By that time, the players on his team had come back to see what was going on, and he crawled, and he crawled, and by that time, the players on the other team had picked up the ball. They threw it in, and the catcher caught the ball, and just as Timmy got there, they tagged him out. But something miraculous happened. The players on both teams put Timmy on their shoulders, and they cheered him. And when they went home that day, one of the little boy's moms said, who won the game today? And he looked at his mom and he said, Timmy won the game today. You see, Timmy was willing to take a risk. He was willing to step out against all odds. And I wonder today how many of us would be willing to step out of the boat. How many of us would be willing to take that risk if we were called on to do so? Simon Peter began walking to Jesus, something we can hardly comprehend, but he began to walk toward Jesus. But all of a sudden he looked around and he saw, oh my goodness, the wind's blowing and the waves are lapping around the boat and, and, and nobody can really do this. And, and he became afraid and all at once, Simon Peter began to sink. You know why he began to sink? Because he took his eyes off of Jesus. And you know the same thing happens with us. When we take our eyes off of Jesus, we begin doing, as a song says, sinking deep in sin. When we take our eyes off of Jesus. When I was a kid, I loved to play football. This is not a sports sermon today, but this is another sports illustration. I used to love to play football, and, and I was skinny as a rail, and that's hard for you to believe, but I really was, and I could run like the wind. I was fast. And we'd go out in a little playground area and play football, and I was always the one to score the most touchdowns. And so I thought, you know, I need to go out for the junior high football team because I'm really, really good at football. And so I went out for the football team. This was in Macon, Georgia, the old Lanier High School. And they, they had 90-something boys who came out for the football team. 90-plus boys. Well, I wasn't concerned about that. I knew I knew how to play. And so we went down to the field where the coach was. And the coach says, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to run up and down the bleachers 20 times. Now I looked at him like he had lost his mind. I thought, why in the world would I want to run up and down those bleachers? But we had to. We ran up and down the bleachers. When I got through, I was so out of breath, I could hardly breathe. And I thought, okay, well now, he'll give me the football and I'll show him how to play. We came back down to the field. He said, now what I want you to do is run from one end of the field and back Five times, as fast as you can run. A hundred yards this way and a hundred yards back. And I thought that was the craziest thing I've ever heard of. I came out there to play football, not run up and down the bleachers and run up and down the field. But I did it. And by that time, I could barely breathe. I was so tired. And then the coach brought out these things called a tackling dummy, which basically is a canvas bag filled with cotton and straps on it. And he handed three of us that tackling dummy, I being one of them. And he said, okay, guys, I want you to all run into these guys and tackle them. By the time that was over, I was bloody and bruised and worn out. I went back to the dressing room I took off my football clothes, dressed in my street clothes, and never played football again. <laughs> I quit the team. It was too much for me. 
That's what happened with Simon Peter. It was just too much for him. He couldn't take it. He couldn't take the wind and the rain and all that. And so he took his eyes off Jesus. But then Jesus did something beautiful. He reached out those loving arms to Peter. Aren't we glad the story didn't end with Simon Peter sinking into the lake? It could have ended there, but it didn't. Jesus reached out those loving arms and he wrapped around Peter because he loves us unconditionally. Even when we take our eyes off of Jesus, he loves us anyway. And he's always there ready to let, wrap those loving arms around us. When I was six years old, I went to visit my grandparents. My grandparents live in a small town, believe it or not, called Meansville, Georgia, over near Thomaston, Georgia. It's about the size of Bostwick, maybe a little smaller. I used to love there, go there. It was like the closest place to heaven I knew of. My, parent, my grandparents was as poor as anybody you've ever known in your life. They had almost no worldly goods. But there was one prized possession that my grandmother had. One of her relatives had given her a beautiful china bowl. Boy, she was so proud of that bowl. She wrapped it up carefully and kept it in the closet. The only time she ever used it is when family came to visit. And then she would bring out this beautiful china bowl and, and put the best food you ever had in your life in that bowl. Anyway, we finished lunch that day. Sure enough, we, we ate a wonderful meal, part of which was served in that china bowl. And when we had finished, my mom and my grandmother were in the kitchen cleaning up afterwards, and she was getting ready to wash that china bowl and then put it back in the closet when I came running through the kitchen as fast as I could run, hit that china bowl, and it fell on the floor, and it broke. I was devastated. But I'll never forget what my grandmother did. She walked over to me. She put her arm around me, and she said, Troy, you're worth more to me than all the china bowls in the world. Jesus says that to us. You're worth more to me than all the whatever. You're worth more to me than you can even imagine. And I'm going to be there for you. Now, my grandfather was poor, but he could do some amazing things. And that night, when we were sleeping, he went into the kitchen and he took that china bowl and he glued it back together so that you could hardly tell it was broken at all. And that's what Jesus does for us. He takes our lives when we are broken, when we are shattered, when we're deep, when we're sinking deep in sin, and he restores our soul. He puts us back together again. He loves us into wholeness. We are worth so much to Jesus. And Simon Peter, don't you know, was thrilled that day when his Lord and Savior reached out those arms and took him and put him back into the boat. And he'll do the same for us. He'll do the same for us. He's always there for us, is he not? Dick Blanchard was a United Methodist minister in the Florida Annual Conference. And years ago, oh, and by the way, Dick Blanchard wrote a lot of songs, including one you probably heard before called Fill My Cup, Lord. He wrote that song, that chorus. He was the pastor of the first United Methodist Church in Miami, Florida. And he and his associate had an unusual thing they did 
every morning before they went to the office. They went down to the Trailways bus station and they drank coffee and they talked about their day and sometimes they read the newspaper. One morning they were reading the newspaper and the headline said, the star of India, one of the most precious stones in the world has been stolen and nobody knows where it is. It was the most ingenious robbery you can imagine. It was encased in an unbreakable case surrounded by wires that would set off an alarm, guarded by armed guards 24 hours a day in a museum in New York City. And they were talking to each other like, where in the world would someone put a stone like that? You can't take it to a pawn shop. I mean, wh what do you do with a stone like that? Where would it be? Where would they put it? Of course, they had no idea of where. Three days later, they came back to the Trailways bus station. They were drinking coffee. They picked up the newspaper, and this is what the headlines said. The star of India has been found, and the thieves have been apprehended. And they quickly read to see where the star of India may have been found. And you cannot imagine where it had been found. It was in a locker in the Trailways bus station in Miami, Florida. Right there where they had been drinking coffee three days before. If they had known it was there, they could have reached out their hands and touched it. Well, our question this morning might be, where is Jesus? Where is he? Where is Jesus? Well, I can tell you, he's right there. He's right there. He's as near as our next breath. And he's reaching out those loving arms to us. So I'll leave you with a question this morning. How many of you are willing to step out of the boat? How many of you are willing to make your way to Jesus, even if it's frightening, even if you're unsure about what it's going to be like. How many of you are willing to step out of the boat? I can guarantee you one thing. If you do, even if you begin to sink, Jesus is going to be there to wrap his loving arms around you and put you safely back into the boat. Let us pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you love us without conditions. Give us the courage to step out of the boat and make our way to you. And if we take our eyes off of you for a moment and begin to sink, we are so grateful that you're always there for us to put us safely back in the boat. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the message that we have received today. And may we take to heart as we go about our life for the week. And Lord, be with us and bring us back next week. In your name we pray. Amen.